I made a little outline of what I should talk about today. Uh, one of them is a thing I might, I, I might have said yesterday. Uh, when we discussed the chain of trust, so you had one CA here, another one here, and let's say this one, and then a person who got a certificate from, from this CA. So what happens if this CA got compromised? Does it mean that this certificate, oh, now let, let me draw a timeline. So this is when I got my certificate. This is when the root CA got compromised. So anything that happens past this point, obviously we shouldn't be trusting those certificates. But what about the ones which were issued in the past? Do we still use them? Shall we ignore them? What do you think? Uh -huh. Okay, so let's try and have a better look at what a CRL actually is. Do we have internet here or shall I rely on my own? Uh huh. This one? 300? You would be forced to, to tell me the password. The wire? Uh -huh. You see, my uh, Ethernet interface is pre configured with other settings, and I really. use my own. So while it's loading, I will tell you about storage of certificates. Usually it's kept in a place called LDAP, which stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And there are multiple types of LDAP servers. For example, OpenLDAP, uh, there is a Novell E directory. Uh, and a lot of other ones. One written by the Apache Foundation, it's called Apache DS. Um, in general, this thing, you can treat it as a tree. It has multiple branches. In each branch, you can have an arbitrary degree of sub-branches, et cetera. And this thing is optimized to be read very, very often and updated not so often. So, you shouldn't be using it as a as a database replacement. Okay, laughing zebra. That's my access point. Now I will connect to one of those directories on a computer I use at work. And I do that by first connecting to a VPN, which will then allow me to access resources in, in that network. For some reason, it takes forever. Maybe this isn't fast enough. Anyway, while that thing is thinking, 
you can um, have one branch in this tree where all the sub entries are certificates. The protocol provides a syntax for running certain queries. So basically you can search. And normally they use it uh, as, a, as an equivalent of a yellow pages directory where you have the challenge to find some details of person so and so. You look it up in the directory and you see the corresponding metadata associated with that person. Uh, a lot of uh, universities on this planet, except ours, of course, actually that's not true any longer. I, I have to take that back because I do know we have such a directory. Okay, connected. Uh, then I will use This is running on the Windows machine, so I'm doing many things at once. Okay, here, unfortunately, I cannot make it look bigger, but I will provide comments. So this is the visualization of, a, of an LDAP, LDAP directory that we deployed at the place where I work. So you have one element here, and in this one you have multiple sub-elements. In each of them you have other sub-elements. So you can have an arbitrary uh, depth, how far it can go, how many branches it can have, etc. cetera. Um, this thing also lets you have something like a schema. For example, if you choose this entry here, on the right side, you see its attributes. So at this point, you can treat it as a key value store, where the value is a dictionary of other key value entries. And uh, using the schema, you can say what kind of attributes it has, which ones it can also have, which ones are optional, which format they must respect if they are present. You have such a thing as types, texts, um, numbers, etc. So let's have a look at this entry here. I'm seeing if I can find a way to make it bigger. No, I guess not. So I just chose one of the multiple CAs that we have. One of its sub-elements is the CRL. And in this element, we have multiple attributes, of which one is the CRL itself. So I am going to show you what it looks like. Uh, you can view it in binary mode, and you see just some bytes. It's not very informative. But if you know how to interpret this raw data, and Windows gives us such a feature, um, you can see several things. Is it readable? Mm -hmm. uh, the version, the issuer who, who maintains this CRL. Effective date. This is a timestamp which is also signed, that lets us know when was the last time this CRL was updated. And this is the algorithm that was used to digitally sign it. And it says SHA-1 RSA, meaning uh, this binary blob, well, blob means binary large object. So this blob was hashed with SHA-1, and then it was signed using the RSA asymmetric cryptography algorithm. 
And I can switch to that tab. And you can see serial numbers of certificates that are currently in the blacklist. And here is an important thing, is that if you look at a specific entry, you see the date when it was revoked and the reason why it was revoked. For example, this one means it's on hold, so it's suspended temporarily, but not completely revoked. And if you have a look at the standard that defines all the magic constants, you will see something like that. So you can temporarily hold it, you can then remove it from the CRL. In other words, if you held it in the past, you can take it back and now it's back to normal. Um, CA compromise, key compromise, no reason given. So you have some flexibility when you revoke a certificate and put it in the CRL. Um, I also mentioned that you can revoke them using a protocol called OCSP. This is the raw data that represents an OCSP request in which we tell the CA that we want to revoke a certificate. And I also mentioned that quite often these structures can be represented in base64. And I would like to share a really cool tool that I use very often. It's a web-based uh, JavaScript base64 decoder as well as ASN1 decoder. And ASN1 stands for Abstract Syntax Notation 1, which you may remember. And here is why I like this tool because um, it parses the structure into its subcomponents. So you can see where you have a sequence, this is where you have an integer, this is one attribute, another one, and as you click or keep the mouse on top of one of these elements, it highlights the raw bytes from the raw data in which this information is encoded. Uh, and if you look at here, at the last digit, 0, 5, this thing is one of, uh, one of these values. Um, now, coming back to the problem, shall we still trust this certificate? If you remember, inside the CRL, for every certificate, there was a timestamp saying from which moment on we don't trust it. It doesn't mean that anything on the opposite side of the timeline is not trusted, is not something we can trust any longer. So it's up to you. There is no rule saying you should do this or you should uh, but if you know for a fact that the key was compromised on this day and not on this one, not on this one, and you can somehow prove that formally, then there is no reason why you shouldn't be trusting stuff which was uh, issued at some earlier point in time. Now, another thing I would like to examine is a certificate uh, so let's look at this one. So here are its attributes. This is a standard Windows GUI for viewing X509 certificates. 
you have the serial number, the signature algorithm. In this case, it's again SHA-1 with RSA. The issuer, which CA made it happen. Valid from, valid to. So that's the validity period throughout which we can safely use this uh, certificate. Isn't that right? Yeah, of course. You just didn't hear that. Um, now, you can have a look at this entry, for example, the subject to whom this certificate was issued. You see some, uh, it's another key value thing, where the key is an OID, and the value is whatever I want it to be. Um, some OIDs are automatically recognized and interpreted as such. For example, CN, common name. But, but this one, uh, 136 blah 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 9077, is a custom OID which uh, was issued to a company upon request. And let me show you where you can take those from. Uh, there is a website, oidinfo.com, oid-info.com, where you can browse all the OIDs that were allocated to anyone. since the concept of an OID came to be. So you can, um, for example, click on one entry, and you see that all OIDs uh, beginning with 1.3.20 are allocated to CERN. So what CERN can do now, oh, let me do this. Oh, I forgot to begin recording the screen. So uh, 1.3.20, anything that begins with this, you can have dot one dot blah, blah, blah. And internally, your software that relies on this they know that if I encounter this ID, I will treat it as follows. If I encounter this one, I will treat it as follows, and so on. In that case, we saw somewhere here this OID. Let's try to look it up and see what the registry has to say about it. It's not described. Okay, let's go this way. No. So, uh, this OID is associated with this entity, which is my company. So anything with this prefix, we can then subdivide into whatever prefixes we want and use it for our internal needs. So if someone else ever stumbles upon one of those certificates and they really want to know what that OID means, they can look it up here up to the up to this point, and they see, aha, uh -huh, the card. And when you sign up for this OID, you have to provide them some um, contact details, yeah, an email address, which they display on the website, but they replace the at sign with, uh, with an end sign. So spammers won't figure it out. Um, now, there is one thing I can tell you while we're talking about uh, OIDs and directories. Um, public hold up servers. Uh, there are a lot of 
institutions that provide open access to their directories such that, for example, if I am a teacher who works at a university and someone just joined and they want to write me an email but they don't know my email address, they can go to the directory, they can type my name, and they will find some matches telling them, well, the person you're looking for can be found in classroom number X on day so-and-so. And there's one other interesting thing. So I just chose a random institution. And let's look for complete record. Any name, for example, Alexander. OK. This is probably down. They don't provide access any, anymore. OK. This one should work. Mm -hmm. So it found one person, but this person was careful not to provide their email address. But if you try hard, you will realize that a lot of email addresses can be harvested from such directories. Not only that you can harvest email addresses, but you can also, uh, okay, let's look for something else. Mm. If there is a person named Smith. So, you see the scroll bar here? It keeps going up and up. It keeps giving me results. Now, for many of them, I have an email address. I see what they do. The name, Alexander Gregory Smith. I'm sorry for making it public, but it was already public. It's not my fault. So uh, did you hear about the concept of spear phishing? OK, did you hear about the concept of phishing? Yes. No. Someone didn't, so let me explain what it is. Phishing is when you send a message to as many email addresses as you have, pretending that you are, for example, PayPal, saying, uh, dear PayPal user, uh, click this link to take advantage of a new offer we have for you. And when you click that link, there is some exploit that uh, that takes over your machine and then you become a part of a botnet or, or some key logger is set up on your computer, well, you're compromised. So that's phishing. The problem with that is that if my mom receives such an email, she knows she doesn't have a PayPal account. So obviously, whoever does that, they throw a very wide net hoping that at least a few percent will actually click the link. Which is why when you really want something done, you have to do some research about the target person and send them a message which is optimized for them. So in the case of this person, we could invite them to some uh, accounting symposium which takes place, uh, I don't know, we can make up some, uh, some names, or we can see who else works in that department and tell them person Y, X, and Alicia Marie Smith are also invited. And since they're colleagues, they probably talk to each other, or, well, maybe they don't talk to each other, but they know that they are accountants, so if those people who are real and I know them are going, then the probability of this being some mumbo jumbo is much smaller. So this is one dark side of having public directories. And does anyone in, in this class have a, one of those fancy at uh, mail.utm.md email addresses? Well, even I have one. 
nowadays. Now the point is that you can log on to your mailbox using a web interface and in the to field, for example, if you want to write a message to a person you've never exchanged addresses with, let's say we have a, a person named uh, Giuseppe Zorzonelli. So you just write Zorzo, you know, give it a substring, it looks it up in the directory and it fills in the address for you. So when I said we don't have a directory here, I lied, but I corrected myself. So, uh, what other reasons are directories also used for? If you go to this, uh, you know, in one of the previous tabs where I looked for uh, public LDAP servers, you will see that some of them are not related to universities, but are related to institutions. For example, the German Ministry of Finance or you know, something along those lines, they have such a directory too. You can connect to it and, and see the certificates of their CAs, the CRLs. This is where people actually use it for what it was, you know, for serious things. But not, not to say that, that this isn't serious. Um, so let's go back to, to my list here. So I explained that, I showed you this. Oh, and this is what a CSR looks like. I encoded in base64 because otherwise it wouldn't be very readable. But now I will base64 decode it. And I will obtain uh, an ASN, ASN1 structure, which I then have to parse again. So for that, I can do, yeah, there is a website. Actually, there are plenty of online web-based decoders for anything you could imagine. Uh, apparently not this one, not today. So let me paste it here. Uh, Okay, let me find another one. Okay, certificates, certificates. Well, my internet connection isn't helping me. But we can do something else. So there is, a, I mentioned a tool <coughs> called OpenSSL, which gives us a lot of cryptographic primitives. Among them, is the option to generate certificate signing requests. So I will do this right now. You can see how the input we gave it was transformed into some big structure and how this structure will then be interpreted by some other piece of software. And I can do that by relying on one of my tutorials that I wrote for internal use but one I will happily share with you.
So with this command line, you generate your key. So let's do that. Uh, see, it takes a while because it's now generating a cryptographically secure. Uh -huh. Okay, enter passphrase. I'm not going to encrypt it. So I leave this empty. Oh, I can't. Well, you must type in four to 8,191 characters. Okay, one, two, three, four. Four ones. One, two, three, four. Okay, now I will view the contents of this file. And this is what it shows me. So it begins with such a header, so whoever gets it knows what to do with it. Then you have this base64 encoded structure, which is also encrypted. Before you can use that key for one purpose or another, you will have to decrypt it. So this is what the key looks like in encrypted form. Uh, Now, have a look at this command line where I will issue a certificate based on this key, which we just generated. It will be valid for 365 days and it will be written in this format. Uh, and this is our CA certificate. If I, if I do this, it will want to, it will ask my passphrase because it needs to use the secret key. One, two, three, four. Now I have to, to provide it some metadata about the subject of that certificate. For example, country name. In our case, is going to be MD. State or province name. Brasley chain. Uh, some of them are optional. You can leave it empty. ACME incorporated. Organization unit name. FAF. Common name, FQDN, stands for Fully Qualified Domain Name. If you issue this for a, for a web server, that's where you have to type it. Or your name, so. Email address, info at mail.utm.md, okay. Um, cat ca dot crt. Now, what we are looking at right now is the base64 encoded certificate that was issued to the CA. Uh, what I will do is open it with something that Uh, parses the whole thing and shows us a nice certificate. So I can click it like that. No, I can click it like this. Is it readable? So you can see how all the stuff we baked into the certificate is now a part of it. 
uh, its expiration date, the subject name, all those strings we gave in, they are there. The organization, the country name, uh, the serial number, its expiration date, and remember one thing, not valid before. You may stumble upon a situation when suddenly a lot of websites don't work and you realize, well, something is wrong. And then it happened to me a couple of times. I began troubleshooting it in very, very different ways, only to realize that something happened to the time on my computer. And it was set to a moment before this area, I mean, before this uh, period. Uh, fingerprints, these are the hashes of the whole data structure. One is in SHA-1, the other one is, is in MD5. And notice how this one is a little bit longer than the other one. Um, what else do you see here? The stuff about the public key and this bunch of bytes <clears throat> is the public key. Um, Some extensions, this is an OID, and this is the value of that extension. I have no idea what this is, but I can look it up. So let's use copy and paste. Mm -hmm. authority key identifier. So if you have no idea what an extension is about, you can always look it up. Signature. In this case, uh, the OID corresponds to SHA-256 and RSA encryption. So, uh, this thing is what would normally go into the directory. It's public, it has no secret data. But remember that before we issued this certificate, we had to <laughs> We had to sign it with the secret key, and the secret key is kept in this, in this file here, ca.key. This is something we should not give to anyone. And we should not even display it on such high resolution screencasts, but since we are not really doing anything with it, it's okay to show it. Um, you know, when I was a, a student, I often had situations when I really wanted to laugh, but I couldn't because, you know, the teacher, I have to show some respect. And now I'm looking at you, and I see that you're really trying to laugh, but you're probably trying to show respect. <laughs> anyway, now I'm a teacher, and sometimes I want to laugh too. And somehow, I left during classes, and I didn't notice that I lost people's respect, uh, or at least I am under that impression. So if you want to laugh, perhaps you could share a joke with us, and we could, but if, uh, if we're causing discomfort, then you can walk out any moment. Um, okay, what else do we, do we have here? If you follow that tutorial, you will see that uh, it generates other certificates. So the first step is to generate the, the CA itself. Then, 
So we create the CA. Then the CA gives a certificate to a server. And then it also gives one to a client. And in later steps, you see how to configure this with Nginx or Nginx. <laughs> wow, I just saw this uh, new piece of hardware. That's what makes all that noise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, the client and the server, each of them get their own certificate. And when the client connects to the server, there is a mutual authentication process. And I will show you how this works in action. So I am still connected. Let me first uh, connect to a I'll get it like this. I have a very lightweight browser called NetSurf, which is something I start every time I don't want to have my thousands of tabs um, around. Uh huh. Very well. It doesn't do it like this. OK. My backup browser is Firefox, which doesn't have that many tabs. Just. Just a few. So if I go, oh wait. I already set up the certificate in it. So what I need is a web browser in which I do not have the client certificate installed. I'll get rid of this. But let me try it first. Maybe it's not there. So I go to this address, uh, TC. It's probably my lucky day. Okay, so the file was written, ping, tc. Okay, it's better. Okay, let's go to the other browser. If I use this wired connection, do they have DHCP or is it? Uh -huh. You know, plugging random cables into your computer is not something I would recommend. But this is how far I'm ready to go to teach you something. <laughs> Now, it should also run out of battery. It, it should give me a blue screen of death, and then we can call it a day. OK.
Yeah. This thing doesn't work. Well, it did give me. Nah. Let's try it again. It still uses the old address. Does anyone have a shareable Wi-Fi connection that I can use? I'm going to try mine first because it usually works. It only doesn't work when I have to show something to you. It shall open, well, it, it acts as if something is happening. Now let me show you something interesting. Something you, you definitely haven't seen anywhere else yet. You know there is a store, Petorochka, near... Um, yes. Near... Lycee Nikolaya Gogolia. Well, there is, it's one of the many Petrochka stores in this city. Yeah. Uh, we recently set up some sensors on it so we could measure the temperature. And let me. So now this dashboard. Well, it looks like a shark. A, a big one followed by a smaller one. Uh, we are now looking at the temperature. So the blue line, the scale is here, 21 degrees. So right now the room temperature in that store is 21 degrees. The other temperatures, you, you look at this other scale, it's something slightly above zero and, and below. So this is where they keep the cool stuff and you can have a closer look. Actually, it doesn't grow that much. So for example, this blue line, it's a variation between 21 and 19.5 degrees. And you can see that uh, this, this freezer it is currently at Yes. 4.3 degrees. The other ones are colder and they have one fridge which for some reason behaves like that. But this is not the main point of why I'm showing you this web page. The main point is this thing there. You see HTTPS? It, it shows it like that because it's a self-signed certificate. It was signed by SEA, which, we, which the browser didn't trust out of the box. Now, let's take the same URL, go to another web browser, Open it and see uh, 
Okay, well, this one, let's go back to net surf. That one doesn't have it definitely. So if I, please, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is what I was actually waiting for. It tells me no required SSL certificate was sent. So instead of typing a username and a password to authenticate, something you can easily catch with a key logger, with a high resolution camera pointed to the person who doesn't suspect anything. Uh, the way I log onto that website is using certificate client authentication. So the client verifies the identity of the server, the server verifies the identity of the client. And in that case, when you are there, you, you don't have to ask the user to type in a name, a password. You don't even have to ask for any names because the certificate you give them has all that metadata in it. The serial number and all those optional OIDs that you may have added. And the web server is configured in such a way that it takes that certificate, it analyzes its data, it extracts what it wants from it, and it knows for sure that this is really the user to whom this certificate was issued. So I can bring them straight to this page without um, asking for interactive authentication methods. So this is one example where uh, certificates can be used for things you do on a daily basis. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. What are your questions? You saw something in the browser, something intrigued you about the web server, you want to replicate this at home perhaps. Yeah? Uh, you remember I noticed uh, the, the reasons for revocation of certificates. Mm -hmm. There are zero to eight. Number seven was missing just because it didn't take number seven. Indeed, I noticed that too. I don't remember exactly. I think it was missing in the spec, but we can see it from the standard itself. Okay, someone, remember I mentioned Bouncy Castle, this library for Java? So in their source code, they define the same constants. And for them, seven is hold, six is cessation of operation. Huh. Everything else is the same. No. There is an, an off by one offset. So unspecified is zero, key compromise one, two CA compromise. Uh-huh. Affiliation changed four. Oh, they don't have three. You see here? Okay, hold on. Um, so we are looking at CR, CRL revocation reasons. Reason code, page 69, page 69. Okay, so this is the RFC itself. What do they say? Uh -huh. Okay, so, well, I can tell you that uh, the code that I wrote here, that I rely on in my system is right, and the one from Bouncy Castle isn't. Because in my case, uh, cessation of operation is five, just like here. And in their case, it was different. And they had a seven. 
what do we do about it? So if you look at this RFC, in the very beginning, and this is really important, you should pay attention to details. So it says, this is RFC so-and-so. These are the ones it obsoletes. So you can check those versions. Perhaps in them, those values were used for those purposes. Uh, so previously, they might have had 7, but as time went by, 7 wasn't used anymore. Because, because 7, 8, 9, and, uh, <laughs> and something happened to 7. Well, this is really not yeah. humane to use 7 and then to somehow take it out. I bet that if you go into the older ones, 7 isn't used either. I'm really curious. So 4630. Of course, I'm not betting my money on it, but... Uh, Uh, this doesn't say much. Okay, four, three, two, five. Nothing here either. And the last one is three, two, eight, zero. Page 60. Well, this one is not using the number 7. And this is in April 2002. Since then, a lot of people were asking themselves, why is 7 not there? So in a subsequent release, they decided to say, we're not using the number 7. So this one? Wait, so is this considered the first one? No. There was another one, two, four, five, nine. So let's try to, to see what happened. We've got five, seven. Page 50, page 50. No, it's not there. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, some cultures don't have the number 13 in elevators. Others don't have the number, whatever. <laughs> and one of these people is probably from one of those cultures. So we have uh, sort of addressed your question. What other ones do you guys have? Shell. Shell shock. OK. Let's try it really fast. Um, we don't have time, but we can. I mean, I will show you how to try it, and then you can see for yourself. We can try it. It's very easy. So in Bash, there is such a thing as an environment variable. Well, let me show you. Uh, so we go to our terminal. Uh, okay. If you type env, it will give you a list of key value things, which is the name of the variable and its value. In bash, which was written at least 20 years ago, there was such behavior in the code that if you define a variable that has a function definition in it and you finish the function definition and then you prepend some other text to that, that text will be executed by bash rather than be handled as a string. So let me show you. Why are you 
Why did I use what? Google I don't know, I'm not. For some reason it thinks uh, okay. I am using it, but. Okay. Well, that's not very copy pasteable, but yeah, it is. Let's take it here. So this is the syntax for defining a function. You don't really have to write anything in the body of the function. It's sufficient, by the way, in, in, uh, in the Google Keep Notes, there were some entries saying FinCom Bank followed by four digits and uh, Agroin Bank. That information is not real. <laughs> Uh, so this is how you define a function. And the thing is, I don't know how, but somebody realized or noticed that if I write anything beyond that, for example, echo test, it will actually execute that command. And this one, been eject. We'll eject your CD-ROM. I don't have one, but you know, hypothetically. So let's do it like this. Echo test. So this is the first ingredient in this soup. The second ingredient is who uses these variables and for what reasons. So there is such a thing as an environment variable you can define a function in it. And there is this parser magic that as a side effect actually executes that instead of keeping it as a string. Now, the next ingredient is that there are a lot of applications that rely on bash and that rely on environment variables to perform certain actions. As a starting point, we can talk about CGI bin applications or, in general, any web applications. Uh, I may have explained this in the past. What is the CGI bin application? It's something that gets, that reads the HTTP request headers and body from STD in. It thinks about it and whatever it prints into STD out Well, it's an uh, HTTP response header as well as the body of the HTTP response. Well, that thing, what this program prints into STD out will then be sent to your browser as a web page. So what typically happens is that these programs can call other programs and they have to pass state data to each other and they often do it via environment variables. And these environment variables contain things such as, uh, for example, the user agent string, the content type, etc. You know, all those many things you can have in an HTTP request. Now, imagine that I have a special browser that will not send um, a user agent string equal to uh, Netscape Navigator 4.3 32-bit on Windows. It will send you a string 
that looks like that. And somewhere after this magic template uh, definition, you have some commands which will be executed by your target machine. And let me show you a bunch of things that they actually try. So, this is something I extracted from the logs of my of one of our servers. September the 26th. So blah blah blah. They just sent a get request to the root page. And this was in the payload. Notice the same syntax here, followed by call wget. It's a thing for downloading stuff. And delete after. So it downloads and then it deletes it. And it downloads something from this address. So it's a PHP script where one of the arguments is the website from which the from which this thing happened. What are they trying to achieve here? What do you think? Sort of. So whoever is the bad guy, uh, the person running uh, remika.ru, they will then look in the logs of their web server and they will see what kind of uh, get requests did I receive. So they have a list of get requests and for each of them, they will see one parameter is equal to decard.com. So now they know, aha, uh -huh, this site actually executed this Therefore, they are vulnerable. So when you said, can we try shell shock? Well, you just have to issue a get request to some machine and, and that's it. You don't need to have a botnet. You don't need to compile something. You don't need to think hard before you do that. It's really that simple and that's what makes it so scary. Uh, let's see a few other interesting things, what they can do in this part. One of the uh, coolest things I saw was trying this. So it uses curl or uh, wget to download a file. So to download a file. Then using pipes and you know this standard Unix feature, it feeds that into a into a file which is then interpreted with Perl, which is usually present on any system. Well not any, but on many systems you have Perl. And then it removes that file. And the trick is, I don't know if you've tried it, but try it like this. Make a little hello world program that uh, in an infinite loop sleeps for five seconds and prints a number. Run this program, watch the screen how it prints your new stuff. And while it does that, delete the file. On Linux, it will delete the file when you then run ls, it will not tell you anything about that file. It's not there any longer, but it's still being executing and doing its thing. So what this thing does is it compromises the machine. It makes it execute some arbitrary code. Then it removes the trace and then good luck finding it. And this is one term. Uh, there is a term for that, AVT, advanced volatile threat. Volatile in the sense that it's there and the second you look at and another second you look at it, it's not there any longer. Tra tracing these things is a real challenge. But let's see what other things people are doing. What about looking through the basic processes you're running? Well, 
you can, of course. But it can come again. But do you really know what all of those things mean? So the thing is that you can, but a lot of them are actually, I could give it a name like RCS log D. You wouldn't be able to know if it's the real thing or, or the unreal thing. What else do we have here? Is there a fix for it? Yes, there is, of course. Uh, first of all, let's see. Uh, what was I looking for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one, so we ran out of time, right? Well, do you have any classes after this? Uh huh. Okay. Well, then this is an exercise left for the reader. See what other things are happening uh, with Shellshock. This one just prints the hashes of the passwords of the users on that system onto STD out, which will then be returned to the browser as a web page. And then you can feel free to play with it. Um, this one is sending emails. Yeah, but does, does having the effects of the passwords really help? Because Sometimes it does. If it's an unsalted password with MD5 hashes. Actually, on Unix systems, if I'm not mistaken, slash EDC password, but press W, it won't help because you need the shadow. Yeah, you also need the shadow file. Anyway, so it takes a while to discuss this, but not today, apparently.